Here we are in the Mall looking at Buckingham Palace and the Royal, the Sovereign's flag for a Royal Day. This is the moment when processions are starting to get a little bit impatient to the off, but uh, we'll have to be patient. It's a day in which uh, everybody woke up believing that Miss Sarah Ferguson was going to be the Princess Andrew, which to some people's minds was a little bit inelegant in these uh, more advanced days. But uh, now she's going to be the Duchess of York. And perhaps everybody had a thought at that moment for the woman who was the last Duchess of York, now Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And on her wedding day in 1923, she went as a bride and returned Duchess of York. And that's how we knew her through so many years. Even the Queen was known as Princess Elizabeth of York. And now we have a new York family. Prince Andrew is no longer Prince Andrew, but is indeed the Duke of York. And I think very especially Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, will feel a, a moment or two of emotion as she watches in uh, an hour or so's time the new Duchess of York emerge from Westminster Abbey. The carriage is going into Buckingham Palace at the moment, but I just wonder, uh, Ronald, um, will the world stop calling the Duchess of York Fergie? I'm sure that the world's press will go on calling her Fergie. Uh, she's been known as Fergie all her life, I gather. It's very seldom that she's referred to as Sarah. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, people still refer to the Princess of Wales as uh, Princess Di, which she doesn't particularly like. So we'll just have to wait and see on that one. It's not an ominous sign if you're seeing the carriages going in with their roofs on. Um, it began uh, to have one or two showers this morning, as Carol Barnes was reporting from Trafalgar Square. But uh, now it looks as if a rather dim sun is trying to come out. It's overcast, and that's probably quite a good thing, uh, not only for the guards, the Irish guards, of course, in the forecourt and all down the route. Uh, not only too bad for them, but uh, for the crowds too. The hotter it is, of course, the more the casualties, because people have uh, just a habit of fainting at royal weddings. And the trumpeters. We're going to hear a lot of trumpets today in the Abbey and outside. It's the Irish Guards, as we've said, who are getting the honour of the forecourt today. The Coldstreams, the Scots Guards and the Irish Guards are lining down the Mall. The Royal Air Force uh, will be around uh, Trafalgar Square. Uh, the Cheshire Regiment in Whitehall. And then it'll be the Navy and the Women's Services who have the honour of uh, keeping Broad Sanctuary. And here, the Household troops. This, uh, these are the lifeguards, you can tell that because of their white plumes. The Blues and Royals have red plumes. There's also another way. Oh, good, they've stopped at the traffic light. There's another way of identifying them um, for, for those aficionados. The lifeguards wear their chin strap just under their lower lip. The Blues and Royals wear it on the point of the chin. So when we see some of these uh, troopers in close up, you'll see if they're properly dressed. Yes, they are both properly dressed. Major Ronald Ferguson, the father's bride, of course, will be no doubt having a peep at these pictures just at the moment, and he'll feel very strong associations with his uh, former colleagues. And the Prime Minister and Mr Dennis Thatcher are arriving at the Abbey. This is uh, on time. Perhaps the Prime Minister can put the thought of the Commonwealth Games and sanctions behind her just for an hour or two. But uh, there'll be many at uh, uh, the other Palace of Westminster, who will be wanting to remind her. She'll be conducted to her seat in the North Choir. Meeting from Mr. Reg Pullen. Past a memorial to the unknown warrior. Mrs. Thatcher wearing blue and maroon, perhaps, but a, a fetching hat. It's quite a large hat, but uh, large hats are discouraged at the Abbey on such occasions, but if you're Prime Minister, you're entitled to that. And Mr Thatcher in a rather more conventional suit. Household manoeuvres still going on. 
The geraniums are not going to be threatened today, not at least for the moment. They will be later on uh, when the crowds come up the now to wait for that kiss on the balcony. And the carriage is now at the entrance. That indeed is a shot from uh, the camera that we have on the Victoria Memorial, right outside the palace. We looked across the forecourt, through the centre arch, down across the quadrangle, and that is the grand entrance to Buckingham Palace. And it's from there that uh, the Queen's procession and soon uh, the Duke of York and his brother Prince Edward will be leaving. We imagine that um, the Duke of York has already telephoned his bride just to have a chat and to, to reassure her about the day, perhaps to see that there's no backsliding. Remember at the engagement, she said, uh, if you wake up in the morning and think better of it, that's all right by me. Well, he hasn't thought better of it at all. Um, there was one moment of bad luck in a royal wedding. It didn't turn out to be bad luck, but uh, King George V and Queen Mary, when they were Duke of York and Princess May, actually saw each other in the corridors of Buckingham Palace on the morning of their wedding. And it was said that he swept her a courtly bow, and uh, it didn't bring them any bad luck at all. It, theirs was one of the happiest uh, royal weddings. So we have a mixture now of the Blues and Royals, all lined up, and there from Alistair Stewart's airship is the scene, Buckingham Palace, ready to go. Blues and Royals with their uh, red tube. And, uh, oh, a little recalcitrant lifeguard's horse there. The other regiment will be uh, being careful. Uh, to see that they don't have anybody quite as restless as that. A lot of these horses, of course, quite mettlesome and restless, and there uh, was an occasion the other day when uh, one of the officers who's on parade today actually was uh, decanted, and he had to walk back home to barracks. The horse had gone away. And at the Abbey, on the blue carpet, they are now really scrubbing away. This is... Spit and polish. That, that's really quite a contrast to the uh, shots we were seeing just a moment ago in the forecourt of uh, Buckingham Palace. The carpet has been protected by some sort of polythene covering. It's uh, clearly been removed, and then this is the, the last moment. Um, They're taking care of it as you would a cricket pitch, I think, between the innings. Uh, yes, indeed. It's uh, a question of really whether it's a, a light roller or a heavy roller. Even this is quite a dignified exercise, isn't it? Oh, I think they've got absolutely the right uniforms, and I think uh, you can wear, of course, a morning suit, or you can wear a lounge suit, and uh, you can wear your medals if you've got a uniform, but uh, these are four of the better-dressed men, and uh, the nice colour contrast uh, with the sweepers themselves. A dandy for Andy. <laughs> they've all been doing their homework overnight, uh, the police are looking on benevolently, but of course down the route, the hello, move over Sam Fox, Fergie's here. Well, that's the kind of thing that uh, page three devotees are interested in. Uh, who is Sam Fox, uh, Alistair? <laughs> and I dare, he probably pays centre half a foot. The Queen Mother, leaving Clarence House on her way to Buckingham House. And she will be remembering her wedding in 1923. She was a very nervous bride, uh, the Queen Mother. They called her the Little Duchess in those days. She was a very nervous bride, and she actually left her handbag in the carriage. And so everything had to stop while somebody went and searched for it because the carriage had been driven away. And uh, while they waited for that, the clergyman at the Abbey swooned away completely, he fainted, he couldn't take the strain, and it was at that moment that the Queen Mother stepped forward and placed her wedding bouquet on the tomb of the unknown warrior. So she's on her way now to join the family at the palace. Yes, indeed, we will be seeing Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, in the carriage procession in just a moment or two. She's a very practised hand, of course, at weddings, and uh, she's been an ever-present 
at all of them. I think there was a little doubt, wasn't there, just before the uh, uh, wedding of the Prince and Princess of Wales. It was thought just possible that uh, she wasn't going to make it, but of course she did. And Mrs. Nancy Reagan, wife of the President, has made it. Gives a, a wave, and she, of course, is a friend of the royal families, but it's also thought that one of the reasons why she is here is a gesture of solidarity to Britain. If the president's wife can uh, brave all the terrors of, and uncertainties of life in modern England, then perhaps more American tourists can do the same. So Mrs. Reagan, with uh, plenty of protection, has arrived now at the Abbey, passes up the path liners of officers and men who have served with Prince Andrew. This is the second royal wedding that Mrs. Reagan has attended. She was here five years ago, or rather at St. Paul's Cathedral five years ago, for the wedding of the Prince and Princess of Wales. She's going to get a more prominent position this time too, Ronald. Yes, indeed. Shaking hands with the Lord Chamberlain, the Earl of Airy, who is, uh, of course, the brother of Mr. Angus Ogilvy. Very, very elegant outfit Mrs. Reagan is wearing. Jaunty, wide-brimmed hat. Oh, she's setting the pace, all right. We'll have a lot of hats uh, to see and enjoy, but at the moment, I think we can place Mrs. Reagan, if a little ungallantly, ahead of the Prime Minister. Uh, that was Alistair Burnett speaking at that point. <laughs> That's right. Expert on hats. It is a long walk up the nave of the Abbey, as we've been saying. It uh, can take as long as uh, six or seven minutes, if uh, you have a mind to. And, of course, with a long train, and we do expect the ride to have a long train, lends itself to such an occasion, uh, that can be a problem pulling it along. I remember when Princess Alexandra was married, her train, in fact, was her veil, and that held her back quite considerably. But that's the job of the uh, pages and the bridesmaids uh, to take care of. And here are the bridesmaids and the pages coming down into the mall. They are, of course, Miss Laura Fellows, who's the eldest child of Mr. Robert Fellows, Assistant Private Secretary to the Queen, Miss Alice Ferguson, half-sister to the bride, Miss Zara Phillips, Princess Anne's daughter, and Lady Rosanna Innes Kerr, seven, the eldest and the one in charge. And the pages are uh, Prince William, the uh, four-year-old son of the Prince and Princess of Wales, Peter Phillips, uh, the son of Princess Anne and Captain Marks Phillips, he's eight. Andrew Ferguson, the son of Major Ferguson and uh, his wife Susan, and uh, half-brother of the bride, and Seamus Macon. And uh, we'll keep the secret, but when you see them emerge, uh, eventually, as we will, into Westminster Abbey, you'll find that they're going to be dressed in a very, very interesting and, uh, I think, exciting way. A stately procession. Well, this is an American procession, of course, the motor cars. I think sometimes um, any country that doesn't have carriages, of course, they don't have the upkeep of carriages, uh, such a country doesn't quite share the ceremonial that we have. And the guards standing stiff as ramrods down the mall under the trees. They face outwards, they're part of the ceremony. It's the police who face inwards and also in the crowds. Uh, there will be undercover police to make sure that nothing goes wrong. If you had driven down the mall yesterday or tried to, you'd have found there have been uh, traffic lights and bollards there. All those, of course, have been cleared away for today's processions. It's uh, an instant transformation. What's fun is that inside the cars, they've already got the idea that uh, they're the stars of the show and they're giving some uh, very helpful waves to the crowds, giving the crowds a little encouragement. They're now seeing something, having waited all through the morning. I uh, should just mention that in charge is the Ferguson family's nanny, Mrs. Philip Tucker, Linda Tucker. And she's got uh, quite something on her hands today. 
all very excited. They've been excited for days. And now they have their big moment. The red ribbon of the Mao. It wasn't always like this in Queen Victoria's day, of course, it was a much rougher road, in fact, just to the north of this. And the Mao was laid down, there we are, and there's the nursemaid and everybody inside knowing how to wave. Just, you must have watched the people. Well, you see, they've got flowers in their hair. I wonder if that's an indication of what the bride's going to have, because the flowers in their hair are rather like the colours, peach and pink, uh, that we've seen predominating at Westminster Abbey. Swinging into Trafalgar Square now, past Drummond's Bank. And, uh, well, nobody's got tired of waving yet. It does seem to me that the boys are in naval uniform. You're just going to have to contain your excitement there, Alastair. <laughs> As I said a, a minute or two ago, uh, we will see eventually in Westminster Abbey how they're dressed. And uh, indeed, you're right, it is a, a, a form of naval uniform. Very, very imaginative idea. And I think uh, everybody's going to be thrilled when they see the bridal procession forming up to go up the aisle of Westminster Abbey. I just see a couple of policemen who should have been placed in the crowd turning round to get their first view. Well, we can forgive them that at this moment. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if they, they were in naval uniform because this is very much a naval occasion. Uh, royal weddings have largely been naval occasions, haven't they, for some time. Uh, of course, Captain Phillips, Queen's own Dragoon Guards. Uh, Prince Philip uh, uh, arrived there as a field marshal, as a gesture to the bridegroom. But most of the time, Prince Charles last time, naval occasion. Well, well there's a bit of a giveaway. Yes. <laughs> very 19th century. The observant amongst us have noticed that the car does not have number plates, one of the very few royal cars, or cars in the United Kingdom, which doesn't actually have a number plate. Well, he looks like a midship knight, so uh, that's a little bit of Gilbert and Sullivan uh, arriving at the Abbey. And these, this is a, an arrival again at the palace uh, of uh, some of the royal highnesses the Queen's cousins. We can't see quite who's getting into the coach. It is the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, the Queen in Delphinium Blue. But we'll see more of her in a moment when her coach gets underway. And into the second coach, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, Princess Margaret, Viscount Linley just sitting down alongside his sister, Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones. But there, a long shot looking through the across the quadrangle uh, to the grand entrance, seeing the Queen and Prince Philip. I should think uh, Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones is quite pleased to be in a carriage today. Uh, she's been the chief bridesmaid so often and had that responsibility, but today she's graduated. And it's uh, Lady Rosanna Innes Kerr, who's the daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Roxburgh, whose uh, home at Flores Castle was where uh, Prince Andrew proposed to Miss Ferguson. And swinging round into Broad Sanctuary, the cars bringing the bridesmaids and the pages. And the navy, keeping the ground. Slowly up to the west door of the Abbey. The Navy really putting on a very good show today. Showing the guards the thing at all. And in the forecourt of the palace, the Sovereign's escort of the household cavalry forming up to precede the Queen's carriage procession. The escort is uh, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Seymour Gilbert Denham. And so they move out through the main gates. And when the Queen arrives, of course, the uh, band will 
salute. The order will come. Royal salute. Colours down. The national anthem played in full. Queen too is wearing a wide brimmed hat, stitched crepe trimmed with two matching organza pins. And now we have Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, Princess Margaret, and her family. And the cheers grow, if anything, even louder. There's no doubt that blue is the dominant colour amongst the royal ladies at the moment. Prince and Princess of Wales, and you're uh, absolutely right, the Princess of Wales, also in blue with spots, polka dots. And it's a naval hat, too, I would have said. That's a marvellous variation on, a, on an admiral's hat, isn't it, that uh, the Princess of Wales was wearing? Prince uh, dressed, of course, as he did for his wedding as a commander of the Royal Navy. And that's a picture that we'll be seeing often enough today and tomorrow morning in the newspapers. Princess Anne, her hat is always worth watching, riding with uh, her husband, Captain Phillips, and the Earl of Westmoreland, the master of the horse. Princess Anne, who's broken, apparently, with the royal ideas today, and uh, very smart and elegant, as always. Pale yellow, a suit in silk and linen. And the Queen is smiling today. It's a happy day for her, very evidently. And the gesture of making her second son, Duke of York, uh, a very popular one indeed. Here come the Blues and Royals. And the Queen Mother. How her memories must go. Prince and Princess of Wales, five years since all eyes were on them at St Paul's, and quite a few of them today. The Princess, a great friend of the brides, and she had a hand in bringing the happy couple together. And she's not in the policewoman's uniform this morning. It's not too difficult to imagine the thoughts going through the minds of the members of the royal family. This is the third occasion that the Queen and Prince Philip have set off down the Mall to attend the wedding of one of their children. 1973, the marriage of Princess Anne, Captain Mark Phillips, and of course five years ago, the wedding of the Prince and Princess of Wales. It is quite staggering to think that it was 13 years ago, 1973, that Princess Anne was married. Yes, just at the outset of the vital strike. We should mention the Greys. Montreal, Peter, Hanoverian, and Oscar. They're providing the horsepower. Princess Anne, as I was saying, with the Earl of Westmoreland, appropriately master of the horse. It's uh, Major Ferguson who once escorted the Queen on such an occasion and uh, rode a little bit too close to the carriage, she thought, and uh, he said, she turned around and said, Ronald, they've come to see me, not you. And on up towards Admiralty Arch. While in the Abbey, the bridesmaids have arrived, Princess Alice of Gloucester shaking hands. And is this then the sneak preview of the dress? Certainly, got full shoulders. No, th th actually, those are the Duke and uh, ah. Duchess of Gloucester and, and their children. 
the bridesmaids and the pages will have been um, tucked away out of sight just for a few moments. We haven't seen them. So those members of the royal family go into St George's Chapel and they will now wait. They even have the opportunity of watching things on television. And at the palace, under the gaze, uh, we have the man of the day, the bridegroom, the Duke of York, and uh, his supporter in humbler families they're called best men, Prince Edward. And they are now moving off. So the great day has begun for him. Going to leave the palace where he was born 26 years ago. They do indeed go the long way round the quadrangle rather than cutting across. They go round the square of the quadrangle and certainly outside the, the doors along the palace corridors and at the windows, the members of the palace household staff will all be there to wish them well. And there's the dean and chapter. The Abbey are waiting and at the palace. Here comes the Duke of York. He's in naval uniform, of course, Lieutenant R.N. and Prince Edward Royal Marines. The Duke of York, Earl of Inverness, Baron Killy Lee, Falklands veteran, rising photographer, on his way in the 1902 State Landau. And as he comes through, the order will be given for a salute and the national anthem, six parts. It seems like yesterday that Prince Andrew drove with Prince Charles to be Prince Charles's supporter at St Paul's. And we should add it will only be an hour or so now when Prince Edward becomes the most eligible bachelor in the kingdom. It's a splendid word, supporter. It's perfectly proper to refer to Prince Edward as the best man or indeed as the, the groomsman, but uh, supporter has that royal ring about it, doesn't it? Well, he is enjoying it all. No sign of nerves or uncertainty. Although perhaps for a budding photographer, it must be galling not to have a camera in his hand when he sees the crowds out at such force. Anyhow, the official photographer, uh, Mr. Mackay, and his friend, Mr. Gene Nocon, will be doing that job. It's good to see that uh, Prince Edward doesn't have either of his arms in a sling at the moment. Uh, I happen to uh, meet him yesterday in Buckingham Palace and um, I asked him what he might be doing today by way of some sort of a, a gag. He didn't say anything but as he left me he just limped away so we, we may see something. I think a number of people do that. So off up the mall. In a little while um, we may see, of course he's sitting on the right as the senior uh, member of the royal family in the carriage. He may just glance up to his left to see Clarence House where his bride awaits him. And there'll be much speculation about which of the coachmen isn't a coachman, and uh, which, which postillion isn't a postillion, and uh, who's really a member of the police. Can you tell from their faces? I can't, but I presume the one who looks least at ease riding there <laughs> is the one who is least <laughs> used to riding there. Well, it is a naval show, no question at all. The army is only used to lying in the streets these days. And in Whitehall, the stars of the last royal wedding. Rolling down. It's unusual, of course, to come through Trafalgar Square and down Whitehall. Um, when the Queen goes, for example, to open Parliament, she prefers to cut through horse guards. That's the way Queen Victoria always went. But uh, this time, as a tribute to Prince Andrew, 
and it's not a public holiday, they have in fact shut the bottom side of Trafalgar Square to let the procession come and go. And in the mile, he's wearing his Falklands medal. And here the troopers come. Every man riding as uh, hard as head in the trumpet major, as if nothing but thoughts of crowns and empires ever troubled their immaculate minds. Although since they've been up since four o'clock this morning, they probably had some rather humbler thoughts as well. Coming down from the Treasury Building, that's the shot as they go into Parliament Square. Past the trees in Parliament Street on the right, and they'll swing into Parliament Square and past St. Margaret's Church. The Queen arriving at the Abbey, moving on into Broad Sanctuary. We owe the uniforms of the Household Cavalry chiefly to George IV. Not a successful king, but at least he could design a uniform. Sleeping round Parliament Square, where the crowds have been out all night. They were camped out yesterday afternoon, enjoying themselves there. And this is what they waited for. The Queen is smiling broadly. Just a reminder of her dress, it's uh, an Ian Thomas creation, dress of delphinium blue silk crepe, and I'm told that its curved tunic line is cut to reveal a pleated underskirt. So they swing round the tall memorial to the old boys of Westminster School who were killed in the Crimea, and the Indian Mutiny. Some, it says, an early youth, some full of years and honours. Past the cameramen, who are waiting for all the arrivals, and up to the door of the palace, of the Abbey. The two medals the Duke of York was wearing, by the way, uh, on the right, the South Atlantic Campaign Medal for his service in the Falklands War and the Jubilee Medal. And the Queen gets ready. She's brought an umbrella. And a matching bag. A blue crepe envelope bag. And steps it down. Steps down, and she'll be greeted by the Dean and Chapter, and the Duke, of course, dressed as Admiral of the Fleet, with all of his decorations, at the moment too numerous to mention. The Queen Mother, Princess Margaret, duly arrived as well, and the cheers of her then. The solicitor's hand as they get down. And up the blue carpet. And uh, reporting all along the route, of course, are the people who keep the time. When we are married, that's the Whitehall Theatre. It's not a farce, actually, but it is funny. Timothy West and the star cast by J.B. Priestley. And very appropriate indeed. That is a great day for London and a great day for the country. It's interesting to see, ah, uh, here's the Queen, with the Dean and Chapter. And of course, there'll be some uh, uh, lining up by the Earl of Ely and by Lieutenant Colonel Sir John Johnston, uh, who is the great director and stage manager of these affairs in order to get the 
Queen's procession together. The Queen Mother shakes hands with Mr. Reg Pullen. And everybody will be guided to their place for the formal Queen's procession in the Abbey. And in Whitehall, the bridegroom Hans Porter on their way. Past the old Admiralty building, which is on the left, and coming up to Horse Courts. We have a house, the Scottish office. Very good crowds were all along the route, and uh, we rightly make great play of the millions of people who watch these events on television. But it's, uh, it's so good to see the crowds, it would be absolutely terrible if everybody's just stayed at home to watch on television and didn't turn out for the event itself. There may also be quite a number of tourists. Uh, it's been possible to hear quite a number of American and Canadian accents uh, around London in the past few days. So it may be that uh, the tourist season has picked up. And, uh, of course, at uh, Clarence House, uh, the bride, who may also be watching just for a moment on television, now that the hairdresser and the manicurist have done their job and the dress, which we are all waiting to see, has been duly and properly put up. Waiting at Clarence House, where the gates open. And here comes the bride. The policeman turn the gates back. And we will see her as the coach swings round to the left. And there she is. Yes, flowers in her hair too, the veil. And I think we can also see that they are quite broad shoulders. Holding her bouquet. Colors of the day. Pink. And uh, everybody is trained to have a look. <laughs> Policemen are not going to miss this moment. And the crowds wave. Yes, just a look over their right shoulders. Here she comes. I'm not going to miss this. I've got to tell the wife tonight what she looked like, they're saying. Uh, one, question, one question certainly is, will her hair be up or will it be down? Flowing has, uh, has become so familiar to us all. <laughs> her hair is down. Her hair is down. A rich ivory silk satin dress and a very rich smile. Well, so everybody. Two questions answered, Alistair. Sorry, two questions answered. Yes, her hair is down. Yes, she is wearing a veil. <laughs> All else <laughs> to be revealed later. Well, since her hair is one of her very best features, uh, I think it would be disappointing to many people if it had been put up in the customary way. And uh, we forgot to mention, but of course, everybody can see him in the background, the proud father, Major Ferguson himself. And of course, it is as a tribute to him, as a former commander of the Sovereign's Escort, that there is an escort of six troopers of the Life Guards following the coach for uh, Lady Diana Spencer. Five years ago, it was a mounted police escort. So, this is another one. Yes, Lady Diana Spencer, as she then was, travelled to St Paul's Cathedral in this same glass coach. It used to be, in the old days, that the bride went in a rather normal sort of coach and came back to the Buckingham Palace in the glass coach. But that was altered, in fact, for the wedding of the Dowager. Duchess of Gloucester, Prince S. Alice, because her wedding took place at Buckingham Palace itself. Uh, her father had just died, and so the glass coach was given to her there. And here at the Abbey comes the, the last wave. 
a look round to see what the good order and discipline is being maintained by the naval forces. Get the sword ready. And here he comes. Smart salute by Prince Edward. And the bride is waving. She said last night she was enjoying it all. Nobody has taken to royal life, I think it might be said, quicker or more effectively. The Duke of York. The world has not quite got ready to call him that. The Duke of York is here with uh, Wing Commander Adam Wise, who is always in attendance. Well, the Dean, the very Reverend Michael Main, greets him. And there's one of these moments, taking the caps, shakes hands with the sub-dean, Right Reverend Venerable Edward Knapp Fisher, Canon Trevor Beeson, Canon Sebastian Charles, Canon Anthony Harvey. And the bride, yes, she is enjoying the day. And a happy bride me means that everybody enjoys the day all the more. Glass coach does certainly enable television and indeed those along the route to get wonderful views of the bride and uh, her father. It was refurbished in 1973, just before Princess Anne's wedding. And so he will now walk up the nave, walk up the aisle past the tomb of the unknown warrior. But he won't be on display for very long because when he reaches the lantern, smiling at the friends that are here, when he reaches the lantern, he'll turn smartly to his right and be taken away from the cameras and our view into St. Edmund's Chapel. And the bride is coming on time, smiling, laughing. Her father has already given the description of what she's been like, bossing him around. He says, but uh, that's what daughters are for. Through the Admiralty Arch. And making a very smart display to the uh, manager and tellers of Drummond's Bank on the corner who presumably are being allowed, well, 10 minutes off just to see the bride. We ought to be looking at the uh, government buildings in Whitehall just to see if any of the clerks there are allowed by their masters to enjoy the day, even though the Prime Minister and the government have said it's not a public holiday. Of course, uh, permanent undersecretaries will be able to watch it all on television in their offices. It has been a long walk, and it's been a 15-minute drive from Buckingham Palace for the two of them. They'll have had plenty of chatter and leg pulling along the way, I'm sure. And I'm pretty certain that at some stage, Prince Edward will have assured his brother that, no, no, I haven't got the ring. <laughs> but he will have. And Coachman Matthews and Deputy Head Coachman Oates uh, doing a great job. We should say here that uh, the household troops too. First time that this honor has been bestowed on a bride and her father. I wonder if she looked out and saw when we were married. I don't think she'll miss much. <laughs> and there's the major. <laughs> Was that a word to us? But to know Ronald Ferguson even slightly is to understand, at least in part, why Sarah is the lovely, bubbly personality that she is, that he too 
is a most delightful person. It's hard to remember when uh, the media have seemed to be so critical of a royal bride and uh, it really has become almost a constitutional test uh, that anybody who chooses to marry into the royal family will be subject to so much uh, rumour and speculation and uh, comment uh, about their persons and their dress size. What matters, I think, is that Miss Ferguson has come out of it all so very well. Her manners to the media throughout have been perfect and she's gone on her way as she has this morning and as she did last night, enjoying it all. Hats off for the senator. And for Major Ferguson too, must have seen sometimes a very long four months of the engagement. Well, Miss Ferguson's at the centre of a great ceremony today, and she's joining a great family. What's important is she's doing what a great many young women still do, and that is get married in church. The royal family, of course, sets an example, but it does seem as if marriage in church is on the road back. It's cheaper at the registry office. People will be saving up for their home. They may not be at all religious but 170,000 couples were married in England and Wales in church last year. And after today, there'll be many more. And the last, of course, was Princess Anne. Before that, in 1963, Princess Alexandra. And before her, in 1960, Princess Margaret. And then, of course, back in 1947, the Queen, then Princess Elizabeth, married Prince Philip, who was just a few hours before his wedding created Duke of Edinburgh. Into Parliament Square. It's interesting that, uh, Ronald, how royal weddings have now become an essential part of uh, the whole interest in the royal family. In the 19th century, they were pretty private. Queen Victoria insisted on them being held out at Windsor or in uh, private chapels. Uh, but now the demands of the media, it seems, the demands of uh, television and newspapers and the illustrated papers uh, requires a rather more ceremonial than just, say, coronations or silver sort of jubilees. And in the interstices there, each decade now has produced a royal wedding. But it does seem to work out really remarkably well that at, at regular intervals we get one of these great occasions which allow the nation and indeed the world to celebrate something very joyful, something very happy, something which, uh, without uh, making us all to, altogether forget all else that's going on in the world, does take our minds away from a few moments, for a few moments from some of the less happy events of life today. And this certainly is uh, an occasion that's undoubtedly captured the imagination of everybody, very much because of the personality of the two principals involved. Anybody who watched uh, the television interview, television programs last night must have warmed, if they hadn't already done so, must have warmed to both uh, the Duke and Sarah Ferguson. And that's a reason why uh, television from the United States, from Japan, West Germany, all installed outside Buckingham Palace all this week, and such an interest going to Australia, going to the United States, where all this uh, coincides very well with uh, breakfast programs, uh, this is one of the events of the world that it's, it's pleasing to be reporting. All to attention. And now she will step down. So they come round the broad sanctuary, stop at the awning by the abbey, pass the abbey bookshop. The ice cream van is not here today. There is the bouquet and the dress, and looks to me as if there's many yards of it. Now, it's important, of course, on the journey that the dress does not get crushed. Without naming any names, 
dressers have looked mildly crushed when they come out of the grass pitch. And so now there'll be attentive hands to make sure that this is a success. Ivory, silk, duchess, satin. Flowers in her hair. She is wearing a tiara, we understand, and that is the one thing that has been lent. It's borrowed. We will not speculate on what is blue. The skirt is flat in the front and widens at the sides. It's full at the back. Of course, we will see her progressing up the aisle. Anxious dressmaker. She takes her first steps with her father. He is, in fact, in his morning suit, the first one he had. He said he was getting a little bit green at the seams, but it has been dry cleaned specially. And he takes a hand in making sure that the skirt is seen to its full effect. I'm not going to let you have all the glory here, Alastair. So a word about the bride's headdress. All highly perfumed flowers, clusters of lily of the valley forming the tiara outline individual cream lily petals, clusters of cream roses and gardenias, and very beautiful indeed. All conforming to the color scheme of the flowers in the Abbey today, and the whole church filled with the fragrance of those flowers, which she will meet now. A shy smile. This is the moment. If anybody's going to be nervous, they're going to be nervous now. Princess Margaret, I remember, was very nervous indeed, despite all the Duke of Edinburgh's efforts to cheer her up. Uh, he was very good, of course, with Princess Anne, and she showed no trace of nerve at all. The Queen, of course, was nervous, we know that. She lost her bouquet. Uh, that was back at the palace. And the uh, uh, footman had put it in a refrigerator to keep the flowers fresh. Duke of Edinburgh, he's enjoying it. The Queen Mother turns around to talk to the Prince of Wales. Do you remember five years ago? Yes. <laughs> Sitting much more comfortably. It's this a very morning. wistful look from the Princess of Wales, isn't it? <laughs> and now, this is where fathers do come in useful. And she's smiling. A smile, a smile that we've got to know so well. And the fanfare from the Royal Marines trumpet. Elgar's Imperial March, played on the organ by the assistant organist, Mr. Harry Bickett, who's American-born. And uh, Sir John Johnston, resplendent in his uniform, who has masterminded the whole ceremony so far. And now we get the bridegroom and his supporter coming into view before the altar. He knows the bride is here, and now they step off. Round the tomb of the unknown warrior, and behind them, the bridesmaids and the midship mites, I suppose. Prince William in a sailor's uniform, taking it steadily. Able to smile, able to talk, able to perhaps recognize some friends. That'll be easier on the way out. And though it was Princess Anne who said yards of uncontrollable children were very difficult at weddings, they've been perfectly behaved.
There are many of their friends, of course, in the um, audience in the congregation today, some from show business, but uh, many of them are also officials, governors general and so on. I think it's estimated of the 1,700 people in the Abbey this morning, 720 have been invited by the Duke and the future Duchess. A word about the uh, dress worn by the pages. Master Peter Phillips and Master Andrew Ferguson are wearing midshipman full dress and uh, Prince William and uh, Seamus Makem are in sailor suit rig. Uh, the midshipmen's dresses, or uniforms rather, are replicas of a style which was worn in the Royal Navy towards the end of the 18th century. The sailor suit is modelled on uh, the garment worn by Prince Albert Edward, who later became Edward VII when he was on board the Royal Yacht Victoria and Albert. That was back in 1846. And now they've come into the choir. Prince Andrew can see her, can see the dress that they have no doubt talked about so often and she teasingly has refused to let him know. Very decorous. And there is the train which is over 17 feet long. Gentlemen and arms stand to attention as they go by, and a smile. And he can see her now. And the service is about to begin. Kerr, senior bridesmaid. Now, the hymn praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation, arranged by Simon Preston, the organist and master of the choristers.
the Dean, the very Reverend Michael May. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate instituted of God himself, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee and is commended in holy writ to be honorable among all men and therefore is not by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand unadvisedly, lightly, or wantonly, but reverently, discreetly, soberly, and in the fear of God, duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained. First, it was ordained for the increase of mankind according to the will of God, and that children might be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. Secondly, it was ordained in order that the natural instincts and affections implanted by God should be hallowed and directed aright, that those who are called of God to this holy estate should continue therein in pureness of living. Thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society, help, and comfort that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Into which holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter, forever hold his peace. Now the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Runcie. I require and charge you both, as ye will answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word doth allow, are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. Andrew, Albert, Christian, Edward, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her so long as you both shall live? I will. Sarah Margaret, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? <clears throat> Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? I, Andrew Albert Christian Edward. I, Andrew Albert Christian Edward. Take thee, Sarah Margaret. Take thee, Sarah Margaret. To my wedded wife. <coughs> to my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health in sickness and in health, 
to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish, till death us do part, till death us do part, according to God's holy ordinance, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee my troth, and thereto I plight thee my troth. I, Sarah Margaret. I, Sarah Margaret. Take thee, Andrew Albert Christian Edward. Take thee, Andrew Albert Christian, Christian Edward. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and to obey. To love, cherish, and to obey. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. In thy name, O Lord, we hallow and dedicate this ring, that by thy blessing, he who gives it and she who wears it, keeping true faith the one to the other, may abide together in thy peace, continue together in thy favor, live together in thy love, and finally dwell together in thine eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. With this ring, with this ring, I thee wed, I thee wed, with my body, with my body, I thee worship, I thee worship. And with all my worldly goods, and with all my worldly goods, I thee endow, I thee endow, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life. Send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name, that living faithfully together, they may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring, given and received, is a token and pledge, and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to thy laws, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Andrew Albert Christian Edward and Sarah Margaret have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God and this company, and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring and by joining of hands, I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully, with his favor, look upon you and so fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace that ye may so live together in this life 
that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Psalm 48, in plain song by William McKee, with Descartes. It was written by Dr. McKee especially for the Queen's own wedding. And now the lesson by the Prince of Wales. The lesson is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, beginning at the 14th verse. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Here endeth the lesson. Now the hymn, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us, or the World's Tempestuous Sea, which is said to be appropriate at a naval wedding.
Now the presenter and sacrist, the Reverend Alan Luff. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, save thy servant and thy handmaid. Who will their trust in thee? O Lord, send them help from thy holy place. And let them, them Lord, defend them. Be unto them a tower of strength. From the face of their enemy. O Lord, hear our prayer. And let our prayer. The Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Basil Hume. Almighty God, giver of life and love, bless Andrew and Sarah, whom thou hast now joined in Christian marriage. Grant them wisdom and devotion in their life together, that each may be to the other a strength in need, a comfort in sorrow, and a companion in joy. So unite their wills in thy will, and their spirits in thy spirit, that they may live and grow together in love and peace all the days of their life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, the Right Reverend Dr. Robert Craig. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has given marriage to be a source of blessing to mankind, we thank thee for the joys of family life. May we know thy presence and peace in our homes. Fill them with thy love and use them for thy glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The moderator of the Free Church Federal Council, the Reverend Donald English. O merciful Lord and Heavenly Father, by whose gracious gift mankind is increased, we beseech thee, assist with thy blessing these two persons, that they may both be fruitful in procreation of children and also live together so long in godly love and honesty, that they may see their children Christianly and virtuously brought up, to thy praise and honour, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The chaplain of the fleet, Archdeacon Noel Jones, the prayer of Sir Francis Drake. O Lord God, when thou givest to thy servants to endeavour any great matter, grant us also to know that it is not the beginning but the continuing of the same until it be truly finished, which yieldeth the true glory. Through him who for the finishing of thy work laid down his life, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Archbishop of York, Dr. John Hapgood. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all grace, we ask thy blessing on the members of the royal family as they fulfill their service among us, that both by their word and example 
our nation and commonwealth may be strengthened in love of righteousness and freedom and preserved in unity and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, pour upon you the riches of his grace, sanctify and bless you, that ye may please him both in body and soul, and live together in holy love unto your life's end. The anthem, Set Me as a Seal Upon Thine Heart, from the Song of Solomon, a setting by William Walton. The hymn, Come Down, O Love Divine, seek thou the soul of mine, and visit it with thine own ardour glowing.
the Archbishop's blessing. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. The fanfare by the 14 trumpeters from the Royal Marine School of Music. Now the royal family will move into the shrine of St. Edward to sign the three registers. It's rather a gloomy place beside the shrine of Edward the Confessor himself. There are the tombs of five kings and four queens. And also the coronation chair with the stone schoon taken, or as some Scots would say, stolen by Edward I during his Scottish wars. And so the train is taken up and the Queen, Duke of Edinburgh, Prince and Princess of Wales, those who are needed to sign the registers now uh, will follow them in. Uh, other members of the royal family will sign the registers later at Buckingham Palace, so that by the end they're really quite full. The Great Cross is actually carried by the science correspondent of the BBC. The Queen Mother is smiling. She has plainly enjoyed the service and looking forward now to the re-entry of the bride and bridegroom. This is perhaps their last nerve-wracking moment in the whole service and ceremony. After this, it's downhill. It was easier for the Prince and Princess of Wales. They were just taken to a side part of St. Paul's. Some of us have waited quite a long time, haven't we? And they have behaved very well indeed, the midshipmites and the junior bridesmaids. And the door is open. You can see television inside. And here comes the Duke and his Duchess. As they come down the steps, 
he will bow to the queen and she will curtsy. And then they'll make their way in procession to the west door. All in ready? There is the curtsy. And they go on over. It's a chance to recognize the family and old friends. Just a moment for proper repairs so that the train is shown to full advantage. It's a train which has anchors and waves. It has thistles and bees. It has A and S embroidered. And now it's time for the off. Loyally following behind. Well, as they go, the assistant organist, Mr. Harry Bickett, is playing the triumphal march from Caractacus by Elgar. That was a march that actually celebrated a British defeat, but Elgar did dedicate his Caractacus to Queen Victoria. And a look behind to be quite sure that all is in order. And he can reassure her the worst is over. And they can recognize friends now. But all the nervousness and tenseness is gone. And for them, and for the world watching, it's been a brilliant hour. And the world is somehow a happier place. And there's the embroidery. A long train, 17 and a half feet. Through under the organ screen to the doze in the nave. We've waited patiently without seeing anything as Peeps did at the coronation of 1660. And they, of course, will be first away from the church. There are a number of uh, friends and personalities here. Michael Caine is here. Uh, so is Mr. Billy Connolly. So is Lord Snowden, Mr. Anthony Armstrong Jones, in the body of the Kirk this time. come out to the cheers. They come now past the tomb of the unknown warrior. There'll be such cheers outside as they reach their carriage. And of course the dress and the train will have to be safely stowed inside. Say goodbye now to the dean and the chapter who have conducted the service. The Archbishop of Canterbury, of course, is only a visitor here. The uh, Westminster Abbey is a royal peculiar. It doesn't come under his authority or even that of the Bishop of London. Gets his sword and the cap bearer will bring the cap. And Lieutenant Colonel Sir John Johnston says, well done. I think that went very well. And they will thank him for having organized it so capably. And some clerical help this time for the train. A young naval officer and his wife. And here are the chairs. And the sun has come out for them. And for the crowds who've waited so long. So these are the pictures of the family album and the pictures that will go around the world. And the pictures, Alistair, not as we had expected of the Prince and Princess Andrew, but 
of the Duke and Duchess of York. Yes, of course, uh, all the places that uh, now exist in the Duke of York's titles. York, he's Earl of Inverness, and Baron of Killilee. Perhaps much of the world is searching for where exactly Killilee is. The Ferguson family comes originally from Killilee in Northern Ireland. I can remember when the Queen visited Northern Ireland and her Silver Jubilee, that's ten years ago, and Prince Andrew was allowed ashore from the royal yacht uh, on the second day, and he delighted the young womanhood of Northern Ireland with his smile and his handsome good looks. After all, the Prince of Wales says he's the brother with the Robert Redford looks. But little can he have known uh, on that day that he would have among his titles Baron of Killilee in Northern Ireland, or the reason why. And there's a coach load and Prince Edward now in charge. But I think there must be great congratulations. The bridesmaids and the pages are all very young, seven or under, and uh, I know at least one of the parents who was a little worried that they might all be too young. And the train is safely inside, a wave to the crowd, and now they'll be off on their way to the palace in triumph. Well, television's often blamed, and often rightly, for bringing us so much gloom and doom to everybody's homes every night. But maybe we could plead these pictures in extenuation, and they will be remembered, and many of the others are forgotten. The Queen had said that she wanted this to be a family affair. Well, inevitably, it has to become a little grander than that, but I think it has been an occasion which uh, the two families have been able to enjoy very much as they would have been at any wedding taking place perhaps in a village parish church uh, somewhere in Hampshire it has been a wonderful occasion for the two families the outriders maybe doing its duty and here comes the happy couple of course there are those who say sincerely that they don't want to see the wedding, they don't want to see these pictures. Well, if they aren't watching, they won't be hearing these words. But perhaps the rest of us can say that we'll return to problems and troubles this evening, or tomorrow morning, but we may do so a little more hopeful and a little more confident of something else. So many people's ability to enjoy other people's happiness, and that's part of human nature too. It's, uh, it's Byron uh, who, who said, let us have wine and women, mirth and laughter, sermons and soda water the day after. The Queen and Major Ferguson come out together. They will ride in state together. And the Duke of Edinburgh and Mrs. Hector Barantes, the mother of the bride, will ride together behind them. Mrs. Barantes, elegant as ever in her gold, yellow, doubled Marocane silk dress. And a little rocking and rolling. And they come up quite hot. And it being 12.35, it may be that lunchtime is allowed by their Lords of the Treasury. And uh, the cars may be swollen by a fair number of civil servants who have left their desks and can enjoy this in the summer sun. Past the cenotaph. The Queen and Major Ferguson riding. Don't suppose he ever imagined when he was commander of the Sovereign's escort that he would ride beside the Sovereign with her escort on the way to Buckingham Palace. White Hall, coming up past the Cenotaph. That's strictly, of course, where White Hall begins. It's been Parliament Street up until then. And she's waving <laughs> most energetically. I think there's no doubt we'll see that wave for many, many years to come.
little more vigorous than the normal royal way, perhaps, but exactly her. One would have thought that after all the preparations, going up past Dover Hut, one would have thought that after all the preparations, that the couple would be quite exhausted with all the planning, with all getting family together, all the decisions to be taken. Princess of Wales has enjoyed it. And the Prince of Wales, he looked a little pensive, but then he certainly enjoyed the music. And of course, a number of people would have compared the music at the two weddings. Coming up to the top of Whitehall. And there is the Royal Horse Artillery drawn up as they went by horse guards. They give a salute to the Queen and the Queen alone. King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. That's a very good turnout. Good turnout here. And we imagine something like 500 million. Think of a number around the world. We'll see these pictures or see them repeated later today. I'm sure more people have joined the crowd since uh, the service began. Obviously the lunchtime is allowing some people who did have to go to work to come and have a, a sight of this wonderful procession. He didn't even look into Admiralty House, you know, and that shows what a young naval officer he is, because I imagine he joined the fleet after Admiralty House, the old Admiralty House, was closed down. Just another part of officialdom and official flats. All riding in state. Turning round to wave each side. She has taken to the royal life and to royal ways with enthusiasm and great, great ability and acceptability. Waving to people higher up, leading from the buildings. And swinging round now past the theatre, and when we were married, round past the bank, and they'll soon go under Admiralty Arch. I think it can be said that television has played its part in making royal weddings so much more accessible and popular. The Queen coming up Whitehall with Major Ronald Ferguson is looking round. She is waving in the practice role. She may well remember 1947, her own wedding, and indeed music that was played at this wedding. Coming up for now, it was interesting today, I think many people will have noticed, that they exchanged rings. There was not just a matter of the bridegroom giving the bride a ring, they exchanged rings. This is Hector Barantes and Principal. And that's something, I was talking about the rings, something more and more young couples are doing. television was not allowed in the Abbey for the Queen's wedding in 1947. It was outside the palace and outside the Abbey. It wasn't allowed inside. It was radio only. And of course, when the Queen Mother was married in 1923, they didn't even allow the radio. Well, they've got the practice wave, all right. There's the Queen Mother. Well, they wouldn't even allow her wedding on the radio because they thought that men standing in public houses with their hats on might listen to it irreverently. That was the view of the Dean and Chapter of Westminster at the time. How different today and how splendidly the service has been organized. That wedding, uh, the wedding of 
Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was in 1923. And uh, she and her husband, who came from George VI, of course, they were the last Duke and Duchess of York to be married in Westminster. There's the former Duchess. Yes, it's been a day they will never forget. They've had weeks to look forward to it, and they'll be talking about it for the rest of their lives. Well, this is the fun bit. They don't need to worry about fluffing their lines or anybody treading on the train. This is friendly people who respond to a wave and a smile. Well, they've got the wedding breakfast ahead at the palace. Uh, they've got uh, a kiss on the balcony. That's something that we'll all be waiting for and the world will be waiting for. And then, after the Azores. Also, they say it's the Azores. Oh, and there'll be the photographs, of course. That's uh, quite often a bore, but uh, it's something in which a young photographer will be taking a particular interest. It's not a particularly warm day, and I imagine they're just very pleased that the rain held off. It's good for the troops lining the route and for the crowds that it isn't too hot, otherwise the casualties get larger. Yes, indeed, it's, it's almost a perfect day from, from that point of view. But just looking at these shots now, it would have been so disappointing had the return journey, or indeed either of the journeys, had to be made in closed carriages. So the weather forecast has got it right. Coming up now by the Victoria Memorial. Nearly home. On this return journey, they'll go round the Victoria Memorial on the other side, so that the crowds who've been waiting patiently there will get their close-up view. And then eventually, when everybody has returned to the Buckingham Palace, the police will go into action, and they will control the crowds, uh, but very gradually, Gently and carefully, they'll open up the mall, and then everybody who's been waiting for so long will be able to mass in front of the Buckingham Palace to await the appearances on the balcony. And that's when the geraniums suffer. Well, they're supposed not to suffer. It is quite remarkable on, on these great occasions how people take great care <laughs> not to actually step on the geraniums. Yes, I remember once uh, there were footmarks each side of each plant, but nobody actually stood on them. Well, the couple next door, they are not. But there is a natural friendliness about them. They're both very outgoing young people. They have plainly enjoyed the service. And that has made quite a difference. No affectation. And coming home. Had to confess last night that they don't have a home of their own. They'll be staying in the palace with mother-in-law and father-in-law. Through the grand entrance, and nearly home. Well, Major Ferguson may say that it's been a very good day, a delightful day for his daughter, and his own suit has stood up to it very well. You can understand what he meant when he was talking in the interviews before the wedding about never really believing that this could be happening to him, he who had escorted members of the royal family on such occasions to be riding back from the daughter of his, uh, from the wedding of his own daughter with the Queen. Yes, he said and talked of uh, Princess Margaret. Very dashing. Yes, he said, uh, looking at the papers, he said, oh, God, there's my daughter. Couldn't bring himself to believe it.
is the grand entrance of Buckingham Palace. The figure in the foreground is that of the Crown Aquarii, Colonel Sir John Miller, who does seem to have the most amazing ability to see carriage processions off from one place and be where they arrive before they get there and then back again. I've never quite understood how he does it, but he most certainly does do it. Now the question is, is he going to carry her over the threshold? That would be a first if he did. Well, it would certainly be the first for the cameras. Well, she had pride of place, riding on the right as the bride. And now a little bit more organization or engineering. And oh, everybody's congratulated for doing so well. There'll be a lot of proud families at this success today. Well, all have won, and all shall have prizes. <coughs> Sir. Sir. The last smile. Thank you, Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Nope, he didn't risk it. Discretion is the better part of valor. Now the Queen has arrived, and so all the members of the royal family will make their way. In turn, the wind is blowing that hat very well. Blue has certainly been the colour of this wedding, both for the men and the women. It's a wedding with a difference, though. Uh, when the Prince and Princess of Wales got married, it was obvious that he and she would have to take up or resume their official duties as royalty. But this time, uh, the Duke of York has indicated that he wants to continue with his naval career, uh, with his wife's approval. And the Duchess has said that she wants to keep up her work as a publisher. It'll be interesting to see just how she can do that, or how long it can continue. So they're back in the safe hands of the Irish Guards. And back at the Abbey, all the guests can go away and tell their own immediate and intimate story of all the transpired. But uh, it's safe to say that people watching on television will have seen very much more. People of Edinburgh with Mrs. Barantes. Is looking from the grand entrance back across the quadrangle. You can see some of the staff, some of the friends of those who work at Buckingham Palace. Many of them, in fact, are now out in the quadrangle to welcome everybody back to Westminster Abbey. Through the centre arch into that part of the palace which of course the public don't generally get to see but that is the grand entrance and it takes you through up into the state apartments there's one part of the palace which the public of course can see and that's the picture gallery it's interesting of course that that was where the duchess of gloucester herself was married the only royal bride to be married inside Buckingham Palace. That was in the old uh, royal chapel there, which has now been turned into the Queen's picture gallery because it was bombed during the war.
Well, the Queen is waiting now, She's waiting for the other guests to arrive, to reflect upon a good day, and such a popular one. The place that royal weddings now have is central to the popularity of the royal family. All the medieval uniforms, or indeed 18th century uniforms, the uh, splendid service in the Abbey or at St. Paul's, or indeed even at York Minster for the Duke and Duchess of Kent, all have a part in modern life. They attract the eye, and uh, the music appeals to the soul and to the senses. And so the parents go in, and now there'll be some times where they'll have to get the uh, bridesmaids and they'll have to get the pages together, thoughts about the wedding photographs. Uh, these can be tricky moments, and then we'll expect them to come out onto the balcony. It's always difficult to know the timings on these occasions. I can recall in 1973 when it was my responsibility to get all the guests together for the uh, photographs which were taken on that occasion by Norman Parkinson. And if I may put it like this, rounding up the royals does, uh, does sometimes take a bit of doing. So we're not quite sure how long they will be before they are able to appear on the balcony. The photographs, in fact, will be taken in the uh, throne room of Buckingham Palace. It's not a room that is very often used, and it's not a room into which members of the public or even guests of Buckingham Palace very often get, but it has been traditionally used for the wedding photographs. I suppose standing on the balcony must take people back many, many times. I, the Queen herself, Princess Margaret, must remember uh, days, of course, uh, during their father's reign, days even in the, uh, their grandfather, King George V's uh, Silver Jubilee, when they were so small that they had to be lifted up in order to see over the, over the side, and the crowds, of course, to see them. Uh, there was the other occasion, of course, at the end of the war, and I was reminded of this uh, earlier when uh, Princess of Wales and uh, the now Duchess of York played their prank and dressed up as policemen. And, police women rather, and <laughs> went out. It's reminded of the occasion after the war when uh, the then Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret slipped out of the side door of Buckingham Palace, joined the crowds in front and were among those chanting, we want the king, we want the king, as the, their father and mother came out onto the balcony. And the so king, there's, the there's king, really nothing new under under the the royal sun, as it were. Well, the king said then, didn't he, in letting them go out um, uh, because they'd been pretty well incarcerated at Windsor during the war. He said then, poor dears, they haven't had much fun. Well, for them, that must have been a tr tremendously exciting, and probably the, the one of the first occasions when they really appreciated just the love and affection that does well up in a crowd on such occasions. That's what the policeman, who said it was a hot and foggy day, wanted to do, but it isn't him. Uh, this, uh, this is the crowd, the banners are waving, and the flags are ready to wave, and enthusiasm is ready to break out, and they're just being held up. It may still be that train, you never know. But uh, there did seem to be uh, a gathering of the clan just beside the window, and we're still waiting as they are waiting. Eyes lifted up, this is going to be the shot of a lifetime. This is the one they're going to show them back at home. This is going to show I can be a photographer. And that's quite an expensive camera. So there'll be proud parents wanting to see how it's put to use. Nobody at the moment has their head stuck through the railings, but I gather that somebody was stuck earlier this morning. Never quite understood how it's possible to get in and, uh, as it were, not get out again, but must be something to do with the ears. It would be difficult for the fire brigade to get to uh, any, um, anybody suffering such a misfortune now. There are so many crowds packing all round the path. Of course, there was the great occasion, wasn't there, um, when the royal family was slow. Yes, there's a bit of acrobatics here now. The um, royal family was slow in coming out to a great occasion. And uh, Richard Dimbleby was the commentator, so it's a number of years ago, and he went on so well and said such interesting things that when they did come out, the explanation was they'd been too interested in watching the television. A lot of 
I'm not even going to attempt to follow that, Alistair. So you can carry on. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, they've come from all around the world. Ah, here's one of the midship mites there. Yes, and um, he's been paid sixpence because <laughs> that's been the uh, gift of uh, Geeves, who made the outfit. Uh, they said that uh, those who wore these uh, sailors' uniforms should be paid precisely what sailors of the day were paid. Uh, that's sixpence in old money, true money, not modern pence. Doesn't matter very much today. And the Abbey, which has done so well, another great occasion for it, coming across the park, through the trees, and it seems as if the world and his wife and daughter and son are waiting. Just a few drifting off down the mile, perhaps. It but can't be long now with the activity going on in the centre rooms that we have seen. One of the things that's impressed me during the day has been the very large proportion of younger people in the crowds. I think there's no doubt that uh, the Duke and Duchess do appeal to younger people. And I thought that the uh, very interesting interview that they gave last night reflected that. I think there's no doubt that their interests and their popularity will be those of people of their age. And they are so outgoing uh, that that may be easier for them than perhaps for other people. Ah, now, action. Just a couple of glances behind. And here they come out. Smile. Now, now. It's been so perfect at the Abbey. Keep your feet off my track. How wonderful, I think she said. Yes, it will be for her a new experience, and it will be... Well, it will be almost um, in indescribable. She will feel, be feeling it now, uh, an enormous wave of emotion and affection and love coming up. No doubt about it at all. He's showing how the crowd... Uh, swaying and waving and of course in a moment they'll be joined by the parents Here comes the queen and the smaller cast of young people and for them this is the occasion of a lifetime and another chance to wave in the practice now you see the uniform of an admiral will fleet behind so that means that there's uh, major ferguson this is hector randall the queen mother and everybody's coming in, joining in from Sendred, the supporter today. Captain Mark Phillips on the right. And Mrs. Ferguson, Mrs. Ronald Ferguson. And the uh, Princess of Wales, of course, with Prince Harry, who's been allowed here. He wasn't allowed to be the page, he was just a little bit too small. He's waving too. Oh, no, he's not. <laughs> well, he and Prince William will have a few anecdotes to exchange after this. Well, the bouquet has not yet been thrown, and uh, if it is the privilege of the senior bridesmaid, um, she's only seven. I don't think anybody's ever thrown it from the balcony to a crowd below. There's the kiss. There's the kiss. There's the kiss. Of course, it was Prince Andrew who said to uh, Prince Charles uh, at the last time, go ahead, kiss her. And he was a little worried if that were etiquette. We got a much earlier kiss this time. I'm sure she has spotted there somebody she knows in the crowd. The Duchess of York. And so the older members of the family, the back inside, smiling. Just waiting a moment, moving a couple 
They learn together. It is a great success for her that she didn't let her hair be put up. I think that shows character and individuality and taste. And another wave, and yes. the wedding breakfast awaits. I don't suppose that's the last we've seen of them there. It'll be most unusual if they do not come out again. Well, the family inside, just moving away. The cheers go on, and I expect they will be out again before they drive off with the helicopter, but for the moment, those windows are closed. And that has been the balcony appearance, and that has been the kiss on the balcony. It's been characterized throughout by the pleasure they both have had and the pleasure that they've given to everybody uh, by showing that they have enjoyed it so much. So outgoing and so taking to the royal role. No sign of movement there amongst the crowd. They are certainly anticipating a second appearance. again. Well, it's good for the appetite before you have a wedding breakfast. And the crowds would have felt disappointed if they hadn't come back. And the photographers. Uh, he picks up the train this time. That's the act of a newly broken-in husband. He's carrying the dress this time. Yes, I suspect that that might be the last time they will come out. But you never know. There'll be some, uh, not some arguing, but some shall-we's or shan't-we's going on in the centre room. <laughs> 